the goal. <laughs> you can aspire. If you can't dream, then what's life worth? What is life worth? So I gotta say, the Game of Thrones books on audio are superb. Who's narrating them? I don't know. Do you know the worst thing I hate about this polo t-shirt is the sleeves have like cuffed in ends. No, no polo shirts have cuffed in ends. No, but it, they end up riding up like this, and you look like a fellow who's after pulling his sleeves up. That's what my experience with all polo shirts, though. Is that not? Is that not? I like. Personal? I like when the sleeves are a bit longer and they're a bit tighter at the bottom, so they stay down. I like personally like a pump cover, yo. Like, I want my polo shirt to be a bit more business casual rather than drinking cocktails on the beach polo shirts, you know? Pump cover is the worst thing you could ever see. If you've ever said, oh, I'm wearing a pump cover or I've bought a pump cover. Yeah, I need to just add a pump cover to my uh, my cart there. I don't think anyone shows up until it gives you the email. Oh, yeah? I think so. There's one person here now, you know. And that might be me. Oh, it could be you. I am present. Does anybody watch? I own a pump cover. Rambo definitely owns a pump cover. Oh, Rambo owns a pump cover. Rambo. One gram of one kilogram of steak is one hundred fifty euro. Is that Rambo? Is that like, is that a euphemism for 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 some other kilogram or something? Because if that's a kilogram for one hundred fifty euro, like you're doing great, like. No, I think that's how much steak costs. And in... no, but is it like steak? I'm right. I'm wrong. I'm making the wrong eye. No, it's definitely steak. Like very much. There we go. A kilogram steak, but is that Wagyu or something now, Rambo? You could be yeah, buying the most expensive. Is that ribeye pipe. or something? He's re he's buying a kilogram of short ribs probably for a kilo for that much money. Where's the live stream? Did they get an email? YouTube just doesn't make it easy, does it? No. Well, there we are. Show me ads on my own YouTube channel. What a way to go. So, morning, lads. Hello, Rambo. Screw you. Dice said, love your content. Thank you. Scott Kerr, hello. Proceed to maximum well on squats. Got 235. Nice. nice. That's, That's great. That's unreal. Got a few posts in the Facebook group so other people can see. Best Harry Potter movie. Ooh, it's between Tree, Prisoner of Azkaban, and... I'm gonna say maybe Goblet of Fire. I, I was gonna say Goblet of Fire off the off the bat there. Yeah, I think Goblet of Fire is probably. Joe, you know, my big problem with the later ones is that the adventure continues on for so long. Like there's so much adventuring, but I like just the general Harry Potter background. I like, like when they're just in school. Didn't yeah, 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 yeah. Even out to the Weasleys' house, I like that. It's a bit novel, but there's so much random like traveling around London and stuff. Tom Shepard said hello. Very funny. I'm about to hit my top set of RTA week seven day two and forty two by two. Wish me luck. We wish you luck. The best of luck. Wish my luck. May the odds be forever in your favor. Bob Log said, "Greeting lads. Currently busy work. Can't wait to get back to training. That's nice. great to hear. I'd like to hear that." Paul, I actually feel like that's one of the my favorite times in training. It's when you know you're starting big training block. You're like, "Oh, it's starting next week." Mm -hmm. I would say it's terrible once the heavy training comes in, but that anticipation, the foreplay. Paul M says, good morning, gents. D Dan says, good day, everyone. Michael says, had a quick question, guys. Working at the sprint season for 100 meters, I lean more towards natural explosive ability with decent strength. Based on experience and literature, where should my bias or my bias, I should, where should I bias my well, training? Well, the first, the first problem here is you lean more into natural sprint. That's your first problem there anyway, Michael. That's like, that's where you need to, Cut that out. I've actually been earlier on this week while writing a script for a video looking at uh, training biases and where kind of training capital should go. Most, if you're asking about literature, most literature is in agreement in that the most specific training reps you can possibly do, whether that be in sprinting, whether it's in strength sports, power sports, whatever it is, the more specific training you can do. So the more specific 100 meter sprinting or whatever it is 60 meter sprinting if you're in indoor season the more of that specific work you can possibly do the better uh some of the biggest kind of studies done ever on periodized training plans versus concurrent training plans all of those will be in agreement that the most specific training you could possibly get away with is the best way to go so in your case if you're naturally quite explosive then you're not going to be somebody who's probably the best at a lot of work capacity work 
particularly if you're naturally explosive and quite strong, you're probably making up those meters at the start of the race. So when you're doing your specific strength tra- or sprint training, you probably don't need to add in a massive amount of bias to the acceleration work or parachute sprints or any of that work. Where I'd probably look at then is the deficit. So you have a certain amount of reps you can do every week at your full on race pace, at your full sprint training. And I'd probably look at working then on your max speed phase, maintaining good positions in those max speed phases, looking at why you might drop your speed a small bit earlier. Like if you're dropping it 10 meters earlier than some of the other sprinters you're training with, what's going on there? Talking to your coach, is it a change in stride? Is it a change in positions? Do you lose efficiency during that period of the race? And then I'd concentrate there. I'd concentrate on your main deficits. Now, there is a way of thinking or there's a, a school of thought out there that you lean heavier into the bias, right? And a, a, an example of this would be a weightlifter, someone like Owen with a massive back squat, very good at squatting. And then rather than him concentrating on technical aspects of his lift, he just continues to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And that kind of carries him through. To be honest, I prefer the deficit first approach. So I do as much specific work as possible. And then I work on my biggest deficits because it is the kind of low hanging fruit. A small bit of work there will get you far more than you trying to get that extra pace in in the first 20 or 30 meters of the race. It is important to remember as well that as you're coming into the season or you're working into this season for 100, that it's not too late to change anything, but it's too late to change any attributes without really negatively affecting your season performance in the the near term. So, you know, you can't really positively affect your, your straight training. You can't really... Uh, make a difference in your work capacity now you can in some ways but in terms of like that specific sprint capacity that i was talking about so it now is time for season work and you have to in some ways do the best you can with what you've got currently unless you have a massive deficit in strength training then you're not going to be able to massively improve those aspects or variables of your training so it is it's not now is not the time to make too many big changes now to be as like specific with your sport work as possible and then use whatever attributes you have and whatever you've developed in the off season and then make do with that and see if you can make progresses from there and then see looking back when the season's over you have a think and have a look and see okay is this what was i missing there what could have been better so i wouldn't worry so much about what it's time to change now or what you should be kind of focusing on too much rather you should be focusing specifically on you know sprinting 100 meters is the main goal for however long this next bit of the season is lasting and then you make that the priority and that is the best route so that's what's going to give you the most gains on your 100 meters currently is focusing on that uh, based on your current attributes uh be asked any guesses <laughs> what huberman's protocol for creating a harem is that's um a hot topic i saw that article last week or the other week and i was like oh i read like four lines of it and i was like i actually don't even know why i'm reading this george says how insanely brutal could a squat training session be if you took six days off after every workout and it was the only lift you focused on. So this brings up an interesting point. You'll see actually Australian strength coach a good number of years ago, maybe five or 10 years ago, he was doing a big squat peak and he was squatting kind of once every seven to 10 days. To be honest, those protocols only work for a very select group of people. Um, you're, your ability to make adaptations without training is only there in the presence of certain stimulants or stimulus. Uh, So to be honest, for for most kind of natural lifters or most developing lifters, the squatting every once a week isn't ideal. Um, It really isn't. Now, if you were doing additional work, say maybe you could only get to a gym once a week and your additional work was a lot of single leg work, maybe some uh kind of sissy squats or some hypertrophy work in your legs and a lot of midline work and you were doing that other training in between the kind of in the six interim days you probably could make progress uh, as long as that that one squat session was was heavy enough you acquired enough volume during that squat session the problem with doing the massive brutal workout once per week is that you spend so much time in that trough that you you are doing kind of massive amounts of damage and that super compensation doesn't necessarily keep carrying over. You will certainly reach a point pretty soon, probably after eight or 10 sessions where that trough gets so deep where you're probably not actually super compensating. You're probably just staying down in the trough. 
Um, so it is, it's definitely a kind of risky way of going with your training. As I said, some people can make it work. They definitely can. Um, if you have the presence of other things there, you can definitely make it work. But uh, for most people, the you don't want to be doing one big brutal workout. The other problem with the brutal workouts is you acquire so much volume and you do so many sets at such a high intensity that the actual quality of the work you do in that session can't ever be that high. Like if I was to do three top sets of five in a training session versus eight top sets of five in a training session, the quality of those three fives is going to be drastically different from the quality of those eight fives. And although if I just do uh, four sets of five on day one and four sets of five on day two, that's a much, much better way of accruing that volume over the course of the week. The quality will be much, much higher. The intensity could basically be the same, but the quality of the reps is going to be so much better. You're going to beat up your body so much less. Rob said, <clears throat> hey, let's just wrap you up the 12-week wave the on the app, running RT 2.0 next. How can I probe maintenance of my Olympic lifts while focusing on my squat? So you'd be looking at probably one full session and one of snatch and one full clean and jerk session per week should be enough. So realistically, in weightlifting, you're not going to maintain your maxes, but you're going to maintain your capacity to quickly start another training block, so rather than detraining. So what I'd be looking at here is four to six sets of one to three reps in the snatch, and then four to six sets of two plus two or two plus one or one plus two once a week for that period. And you're hitting somewhere between 70 and 85% in more volume at kind of you're trying to hit more volume at weights and you are trying to do heavy singles and you're trying to maintain technical proficiency with that volume and you're trying to maintain those positions as much as possible so that should be enough while you're doing the olympic lifts or folks in rt 2.0 just bear in mind as well is that the rt 2.0 is a bit longer than those eight weeks so it is depending on what your goals are in weightlifting it might be a bit too long to just do that one session per week in the snatch and clean and jerk so do bear that in mind but that is where I'd be going from there. And if needed, you could have added in some variation, maybe some powers on another day of the week if necessary, and keep doing some pulls also. Uh, John Aird said, how do I fix one trap being lower than the other? It's not an injury, but I'm not sure what it is. Uh, John, that could be anything. could be an old injury. It could be the way your clavicles are set, or it could be could be scoliosis. It could be anything. So and I couldn't really answer that, uh, John Aird. John Hard in John Hard in regards to that question, it could be any number of things. I would always start with some stretching soft tissue work, last thoracic, start stretching those, see what feels tight. Look at the opposite side, is it restricted? Uh, your lats, you know, uh, SI, glutes, stuff like that. But uh, wouldn't really be able to give you much of a help on that one without, you know, going and obviously seeing what's going on, maybe. But even then, it's probably worth going seeing someone. Uh, Thomas Wright said, How's PJ going? Do you feel more confident in the streets, not sure, Shane Killers? Um, ideally, we just never have to get into an altercation on the streets, will be the main thing. Yeah. But uh, BJ is going good, I think, uh, nice and consistent. I'd get two sessions per week, and that's the most I want to get and the most I can really get, to be honest, with other training in life. It's, or it's, it's rather it's the, the most amount I want to commit to it. <clears throat> Balrog says, how about a April Fool's Day version of the new show with odd and stupid yet impressive lifts? So the big problem is this week there's some insane lifts for the new show already. Oh shit! It's 29th of oh, April. It's next Monday. Yeah. This night, 29th, 30th. Oh yeah, that is. So maybe we'll have some obscure lifts, but there is definitely some legitimately, absolutely outrageous lifts that went on in the last week. Mm -hmm. So they'll they'll have to be included. It can't all be foolish. Benjamin said, "Can consuming homogenized milk lead to bad health outcomes over time?" As I've heard that small undigested fat particles can lead leak. can leak into the bloodstream. I, I don't think that's the thing. I would say your fat would just be digested normally along with anything else in your stomach and intestines. I don't think uh, the there, composition of the fat is going to cause any issue. There's a lot of dairy hate, hate going on a no, few years ago. Well, it's like pasteurized and homogenized dairy hate. Yeah. But there's a big love for raw dairy at I, the moment. I just think milk is great. Johnny OnePlate says, good day, gents. Forum question. Is B stance and or triple extension appropriate for cyclist training? Thanks. B stance 
for me is pretty much useless for everyone. And um, B stance is, is a carryover from the world of bodybuilding. Um, B stance for strict presses, B stance for rows, all of that kind of stuff. It really isn't. Um, B stance, no, uh, stiff like a dentist are good. Yeah, that's, that's about the good. only thing. Yeah. Um, they from, are quite useful, though. I think the B stance deadlifts are quite good at stiff like a deadlifts. Yeah. I can't think of other times where B stance is good. No, but in that scenario, I think it is good. Is that for RDLs? Does he stay that? Well, if it's press or anything else, it's kind of stupid. But if it is uh, if it's just for... Uh, and or triple extension. Triple extension, like the, the training of triple extension is good. To, to be honest, any of those kind of large scale or large load bipedal triple extension exercises are going to be useful, whether that's a loaded jump, whether that's a power clean, whatever it is. Triple extension exercises are useful. They're they're in everybody's S and C programs for a reason. Um, I I personally don't like B stance unless it's in that particular exercise. But the the use of B stance besides that is it's probably pointing to a lack of stability or lack of ability to maintain positions in standard normal bipedal stance. For most cyclists, a good mix of unilateral and bipedal stuff is or bilateral stuff is pretty much perfect. Um, Metroban said, can a hack swap be a suitable replacement for belt squats? Yeah, yeah, it can be. You do get some upper body loading or spinal loading with the hack squat, but obviously when it's generally on the, the lever or on that kind of end of that swing, it's not as bad. So I think it would be a decent way of folks in the quads. So, um, there is sometimes some of those where you are kind of forced to, it's the one that I'm thinking of, is it the sled one or the... You know, there's one where you're lying on your back and you're pushing, and there's another one on your shoulder. Are they both hack squat machines? They are. I think what is one a 45 degree hack squat? So if there's one where you're lying on your back, that could be a decent one for sure. The one on your shoulder, the only thing you should be, <clears throat> be looking at is sometimes is due to the way that goes up, it goes up on a curve. Um, some of those machines, so you're forced to kind of send your hips back early, which would be defeat the point of doing hack squats in replacement for bell squats. So in that case. That wouldn't be ideal unless you can modify it or do it in such a way that it's all in your quads. If that's the case, if you have a hack squat machine, you probably have something like a leg press. So the leg press machine might even be a better option in that scenario than doing the hack squats like that. So it depends. Again, leg press and hack squat are a little bit lower. That bow squat machine is just the top notch for focusing on those knee extensors. And don't forget as well, it's not as good because you don't get as much loading. And obviously you're in a seated position and kind of sitting back but single leg extensions can be quite useful uh, adjacent to the two of those so maybe if you had belt squats plus leg extensions it is quite handy but uh, belt squats just are very 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 useful in that regard for the bipedal quad focus no loading your spine it is really fantastic and then the last option is heels elevated zombie front squats now they have, do have a bit of technique to them and do require a bit of setup. So you have to have some plates underneath. And if you want to do, you know, higher reps or heavier weights, it is going to load your back a bit. But there, while they do still have some back loading, it is very, very useful for the quads also. Denny Elvi says, hi lads, my son is 15, an amateur boxer who's on the smaller side. Kids his age seems to be more developed want to get him strength training on the off season would love to have your recommendations so definitely he should be doing strength training in the off season and um, but and this goes across all sports that age between 14 and 17 or 14 and 18 the rate of development is so utterly different among athletes to the point where most talent id systems they will will actually just take certain athletes that they know are going to develop later and they'll put them in a slightly different stream where they're not fighting or playing against um, guys or girls who are massively more developed than them. It's just the way that youth sport goes. It's unfortunate where people who develop a small bit earlier and are a small bit bigger and stronger tend to get more opportunities. They'll tend to go to certain competitions and have more experience, and then it'll lead to them being more skilled. So definitely the strength work is massively important in the off season. But what I will say is with the view of him developing as a good athlete, don't pour all the energy into your biggest problem is that you just need to be as big and as strong as the other guys if, if or girls. If they're 15 
it's very likely that that growth spurt and that that kind of bump in in athleticism that comes along with that will happen. Maybe it's this year, maybe it's next year, maybe it's the year after, but there's no inherent rush. Now, the biggest issue with athletes in this case is keeping them in the game, keeping them in the sport. It's very, very difficult. They're constantly getting beaten up by bigger guys and girls to keep them involved, keep them interested, keep them in that kind of top tier of training or top tier of of competition. So definitely do do the off season work and um, off season strength and hypertrophy work. I wouldn't I wouldn't go crazy kind of putting them into a camp and really focusing on on grinding them down into the ground. And we see that very very commonly that they either try to make massive gains in size and strength that aren't necessarily going to come no matter what you do it's the main thing is keep them developing well keep a good momentum going there and just make sure all those skills are being refined all the time something we come across in ireland all the time is rugby players being too small they miss out on a massive amount and that growth spurt might come when they're 17 or 18 and that might be too late at that point because they're not mixing with the right players mixing with the, the right coaching staff but it is difficult. Uh, th those kind of rates of development are quite difficult to keep a very skilled athlete involved until that happens. So in their off season, probably four days a week in the gym, normal strength and hypertrophy work. If you want to see a rough outline of the programs we'd be recommending, get the free trial on the app. Just download the Seeker Strength app. It's free. You can look at the program. You don't have to, to sign up to a subscription or anything. You'll get a week there for free do the off-season strength and hypertrophy block one, and that will give you an idea for what myself and Owen will be talking about. Squatting, pressing, pulling, rowing, all of those things. Um, but my major thing would be don't try and pack on as much weight and as much size as possible uh, as it will negatively affect the, the actual skill outcomes in the in the in-season then. So <clears throat> Paul's asking, when looking at hamstring action in athletics, do you find the need to include knee flexion exercises, Nordic curls, ham curls, or are go-to extension, go-to extension exercise sufficient? So um you're kind of you're asking a question in regards to the nature of S and C there in regards to do you do hyper specific the range of motion work that is as close as possible to the sport endeavor, or do you do strength work? that builds that range of motion and more than it in the most applicable way possible and then let the S and C or let the sport specific work develop it then. So in our case, it's primarily the slatter option. You do the smartest strength training work for the joints and muscle groups involved and make them as strong as possible and forget about the specific, not specific actions, but the specific ranges of motion they might move through or the loads are moving through and you progress those in terms of what is the strongest way we can make our hamstrings consistently as safe as possible and repeatable endeavor and then looking at specific angles so in regards to like knee flexion you knee flexion wouldn't be an isolated endeavor in terms of say running so if you talk about athletics it's obviously a locomotive so just heading in a direction so you're also looking at hip flexors raising of the leg and then you're looking at knee flexion you know if you're looking at a running you're looking at it in a standing angle and you've your shin perpendicular to the floor but we're not going to start doing you know i know you said nordic curls we're not going to start doing um cable knee flexion standing or something with a cable machine we're going to be looking at bulgarian split squats we're going to look at back squats um nordic curls definitely do feature in ham curls your best bet is not to be too granular when you look at these things we look at lower body and obviously we look at single leg work and we hedge your bets and we look at full range of motion and we're looking at things like back squats we're looking at uh, split squats we're looking at are we covering enough for example of the hip flexors in regards to squatting usually the answer is no especially for runners you want to be more specific in addition to your regular training so you're looking at that in terms of you know weighted hip flexor raises, you're looking at stuff like hamstrings, you're hitting the big movers, you know, stuff like stiff legged deadlifts at Nordics are very, very popular, very difficult to do, but it's something we do feature. So the answer to the question is, is yes. Um, do you want to be, you kind of want to hedge your bets, but you also want to be, you don't want to be stupid about it or too specific about it. And I'm not saying in your particular case you are, but that's the issue that some S and C coaches, and I think, I think there's more of us than ever now, and there's more of them ever on Instagram, so it seems like we're seeing more of it, but I'm not sure if it's there was just as much 20 years ago as there is now. But the answer is we're looking at what muscles do we need strong? 
in what way do we need them to be strong for the specific sport? And usually it's like strength is never a weakness. That Mark Bell phrase, I think, is always applicable. So we're looking at lower body strength, hamstring, hip flexors, which is very readily part of that knee raising action or that knee flexion action when they're running. Uh, and then, you know, hamstrings, control the hips, biotecular muscle, your knee joint and your hips as well. So you're training the hamstrings. Like you're just training everything. You're never going super granular. You know, if you're looking at runners, most of them are doing similar stuff. And then really it's a magnitude of what you're going to. It's probably the biggest deficit. So if you were comparing a shot putter and a 800 meter runner, you know, we're not, we're not going to be looking at the same quantity or absolute value of power cleans or relative body weight power cleans and back squats to to the uh, the 800 meter runner to the shot putter. So you're kind of like, okay, we're going to go for that shot putter. We're looking at what's the biggest back squat we can do without just absolutely destroying you. But whereas the 800 meter runner, we're like, okay, we're like, and we had one and a half times body weight to a decent depth. We're like, okay, that's pretty decent. Or you know, when we're getting close to double body weight, then we're probably like, we might never go beyond that. Can we make it better quality? Can we maintain close to double body weight in the in-season as opposed to try to keep pushing it? Whereas again, with that shot putter, we're doing the same thing, but you're getting vastly different training outcomes and drastically different training focuses. And, you know, is it Daniel style is like squatting like 300 kilos for reps? Like, there's no reason. Well, you, if you could get a 60 kilo, 800 meter run to squat 300 kilos like that, then in theory, you would have a great time. So... It, it's not that you don't get specific to the sports that you do, but it's more common than not. And you're covering most of your bases broadly in a lot of fashions. So a lot of S&C looks quite similar. Uh, and as much as some coaches want to be that go-to for that sport, if they're the, um, give me a sport that's not going to target anyone. If they're the javelin throwing s and Yeah, if they're the javelin throwing s and coach, you know. But in reality, a good s and coach with a bit of thought, a bit of investigation, a bit of talking to that athlete, will be able to adapt it if you can't then you're not a very good SNC coach in my opinion but similarly if if you're if you're that super specific coach i would be raising eyebrows now if that's what you like to focus on that's one thing yeah yeah or if that's where most of your athletes lie yeah. that's one thing of course of course there's, there's actually a really good i think it was tabata at uh, the japanese academic stroke coach who developed the tabata method for speed skating was in the US or Canada and was watching a team of rowers or paddlers or kayakers or something training and then said like from the off he's like oh this these are the things you need to fix you know like once you know the way broadly it's very applicable um Owen's covered nearly all of this but one other thing on those hyper specific areas for a very specific sport and let's just take hamstring capacity for that these problems rise to the surface a lot earlier and a lot more obviously than you might actually want to believe so in this case if it's hip flexor strength or if it's hamstring strength or hamstring capacity you'll notice the athletes pulling up or you'll notice in the high capacity or high intensity training sessions that one area or maybe two areas will start to raise their head more frequently than others and maybe it's something as simple as the athlete coming out of the blocks and rising up early um, and no matter how much coaching you give to an athlete, they'll always tend to rise up early. And then you'll you'll start slowly looking into, OK, why is that happening? Why are they favoring to come out of that acceleration phase early? Or why are they breaking down from that max speed phase earlier than their their uh, counterparts? And those those kind of areas then can be looked into. But you obviously want to be as general as possible, make them a good athlete. And make them all good athletes. Um, I'm after losing where I was, and I skipped ahead. John Candler. John says, if you had to guess today, who are the three male Chinese lifters that will be sent? I'll make a guess now and say Tian Tao will not be sent. I think Li Fabian is probably going to go. Xi Jiang, I think, is going to go. Dr. Steph tells me he's in great shape at the moment. Best he's seen him in a long time. And I think Pablo Zed afterwards later on says he doesn't think he's not buying that Chi Jiang is in shape. Steph sees him every day. Steph treats him. Steph was training on his platform, Dr. Steph. So if he says he's in shape, then I think he's in shape. Uh, and I think, I don't think we're going to see 89s. Although if I had to put money on it, I'd probably say Lee Wanwa. But I think the Chinese could surprise people and send Lee Day in. Mm. Like he could have progressed a lot more into the 89 kilo class, like he'll have matured even more. 
and he was growing into that class. So there's a possibility he's done like 182, 185, 225 in training. And they're not going to show anyone in Thailand. And then they're going to pull it out hard at the Olympics. So I think that's a possibility. But if someone was like money on the table, I'd probably put Giga Chad as a third option. Yeah. She, I think she's on definitely going. I don't, if it was between the 89s and Xi Jiang, like Xi Jiang is definitely, he's been the most dominant before. And, you know, he's a freak athlete. Like he, he has it in him. He has the X factor to just get back in shape. Like it's, it, it's, he is him. Yeah. He is that guy. I, I also don't think that Thailand means that much. I think a lot of people are thinking there's going to be these massive performances in an Olympic year. I really don't think we're going to see those crazy standouts. I think I think those decisions are made in abstention of that competition. What could happen is Tian Tao could be not selected. And he's like, right, fuck this. I'm going to show them. Oh, so you mean like he, oh. he might come out and want to do like I could see him doing 182, 30 and 89. It's not. Yeah, it's insane. Maybe like two twenty-seven. I could see him being like, "Look, you should definitely send me." So I think for Dento, unless he's already selected, he's going to go huge at this competition. Yes, and lead in. But I think most other people are going to be like, "Meh," like unless you're, like unless you're in danger of losing your spot as number ten, mm. like or if you're edging at a number eleven, you're like if you're number five, you're going to be like, "Whatever, I'm just going to do." Yeah, just if you even need to do it. But I think, to be honest, mostly I think it's literally the two lifters. I think maybe the 73s are probably going to go pretty ham, maybe. Um, see, again, it depends on what's happened internally and who needs to prove what. Yeah. I actually think Team China are probably the people who are going to go the most ham, unless already the internal decisions are made and they're like, I, right, you're going, you're going. I feel like those decisions are made. But they could be made in the Addy Zone, no. Yeah, 100%. Which would be the smart thing to do. Push them. Ryan Fouts. Push them. <laughs> not as if they're not being pushed hard enough already. Push them. Ryan says, do you have a general preferred method, i.e. Westside Conjugate, 531, Triphasic? I know it's all typically dependent on athletes and constraints, but interested to what you guys have a preference on. Yeah, we definitely do. It's our own method. It's our own method. Take a strength method. So it's, it's very much block periodized training. Um, with an emphasis on specific training the, the, the just to pick in and this isn't having a go off you or anything like that but the idea that the best training program relies on what the athlete needs is the, probably the biggest lie we've been sold in sports development for the last 20 years the idea that conjugate's going to work better for somebody because they have this way of training or triphasic or block periodized versus concurrent is really athlete dependent it is absolutely not. And I don't think any better literature or any high level coach will, will disagree with me on that. The best method is the best method and the best method exists. Um, and it, most countries will be in, in strong agreement on that. Individual coaches will have their individual ideas on that. But when we look at what most professional athletes do in most countries in the world for the last 70 years, I think everybody is in agreement with it. Um, and now, obviously, myself and Owen sell training programs. We write training programs. We change them. We make alterations. And it's in people's interest to say that this, whatever, the ultimate Titan training is the best way to go about it. But in reality, no matter what country you go to, no matter where in the world, no matter what the sport, athletic development is very much an agreed upon system that that almost everyone uses uh, in weightlifting and sprinting no matter what it is um athletic development doesn't really deviate too much from that and in cases where you have individual coaches coming up with their individual things they call it something like let's look at 531 531 in its most basic term is a highly specific training program that has linear progression from week to week and that's it it's an incredibly simple method it's linear progression with the ability to achieve high levels of volume in certain sessions uh, and then you accrue, accrue volume over a number of weeks you peak and you hit heavier numbers and that's in the very same way that uh, the triphasic method will work the the scales and the rates of progression are slightly different the concurrent versus block periodized is slightly different which is the reason many 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 people don't use concurrent training i know we have some coaches in some countries use it uh, but on the whole, 
everybody is doing very, very similar things or they use very similar frameworks. And then it comes down to the intricacies of how those rates of progression worked, what time you spend in each of those blocks, how long an athlete needs to accrue volume for before they peak, how those peaks look, whether it's a very sharp peak and taper, whether it's a prolonged time in a peaking phase before you taper, they're the kind of intricacies. Um, but definitely most athletes should be doing simple block periodization and then we make our alterations in those. It's very important to remember as well that there's no way to progress as a human being without something that resembles periodization. Like it's not possible to hit your peak performance at training. Otherwise it's either not your peak performance or you just haven't been trained. Like there's no way it's all periodized. There's just no other way around it. Like it's all periodized, all training. You start at a lower base and you work your way through until the final goal. Like you don't start at your final goal. Like it's just, no matter what anyone says, like if you look at the conjugate methods, if you're doing your random maxes and eventually you come back around to your safety bar squat, you're going to do a heavier squat. And so you're, you're periodized your own training. Like there's no other way of progressing. And you won't hear the coaches who sell conjugate coaching at the moment say that, but Mark Bell said it in their kind of post documentary when Louis Simmons uh, died. They were like, yeah, Louis did uh, periodization. It's not possible to progress. It's all periodization. Everything is periodization. Everything starts away from your end goal and you progress towards that. Like people think sometimes think of periodization as a product rather than the physiological adaption to training. Now, then you obviously have that specific stuff in regards to are you primarily concurrent in your adaptions? And you really don't see professional athletes training in a strongly concurrent basis. Now, the lines are going to be blurred all the time in some ways. Like you're not going to, you don't have to go from your high work capacity phase and then just chop off all of your your work capacity stuff and then move straight into your strength stuff. You know, you're going to blend it in for some athletes. It's going to look like you're just a high volume worker on the minute stuff and then you're moving on to sort of straight sets. And that's where your line is rather than being your very distinctive changes. Some places will look like that. But for example, you know, rugby players are never going to stop throwing a ball. Sprinters are never going to stop doing some track work. So in some ways, would you call that concurrent? It depends. Some would consider concurrent only when you're pushing towards certain variables and concurrent works in some regards. But if you're looking for an absolute peak performance in something, like the horse program is a concurrent program, but it's also a periodized program because you're working toward maxes and then you have a section at the end where you're doing some heavy singles and you're doing your heavier jumps or your higher jumps. Heavier jumps sounds so weird, but you know what I mean. And you're still trying to build muscle along that way. So there is some differences in it but it's all periodization periodization is just physiological adaption towards starting further away from your goal because you can't do your end goal without some training and then you move towards that you know and it's uh it's a miss it's kind of a, a misnomer i suppose among the commercialization of training rather than what just happens is that you train you're not at your goal you keep training and you do less of some of that and hopefully get closer towards your goal at the end you know that's like you just don't go up and snatch two inch kilos or run 10 seconds or sub 10 and 100 meters it just it's all training like it's all periodization yeah. like there's no way around it and it's not a product to sell it's just that's what it is that's just how it is that's yeah. how it be uh satyar 13 says on your road to 300 kilo squat did you deal with any knee pain hypothetically if you did would you just push through it oh and that little lot of pain all the time um actually you know what so you might have seen a video on our youtube from like august 2000 and no more before august july before that june june 2020 what's this 24 22 if you look at seek strength knee rehab rocco our good friend is a chiropractor he's in greece i had really bad knee pain worst my knee pain has ever been in my entire career of athletics and training anything since i was six years old it's the worst knee pain i've had like it was really like squatting a huge hip shift from the pain I was shifting away from the knee really bad on both knees and I was over seeing some friends and Rocco was there and I got some treatments for him and he paid us never back since <laughs> I don't know he how literally to fix that in like two sessions wasn't it it was so we did a really intensive rehab three or four day stuff went through that and then by five or six days later 
knee pain was almost completely gone. We're talking like 90% gone. I kept doing that rehab for four months after that, even though the knee pain is gone. But I, knowing how these things know, uh, you should just keep doing that rehab until it becomes your prehab. And then I kept doing it for four months after, even though the knee pain was gone. And then just knee pain has never come back. Now, I've had plenty of other pain. The hip flexor, IT band, wrist, elbows, shoulder, hip, but no knee pain. So, yeah. If would I've pushed through it, I would have absolutely tried to deal with it without stamping, for sure. But if it got to a stage where I Swiss cheese for tendons, yeah, I would have stamped, probably. Maybe. Maybe. Fleo says, you guys made some videos in the past about expected numbers after X number of years for average size people. What about for smaller people? Convert to Sinclair question mark. To be honest, smaller people are just, it's just so uncommon. Yeah. It just, I've never coached a 50, 60 kilo male, to put it that way. And we've seen literally thousands of lifters. Yeah. So I wouldn't give you any recommendations. I will say it's come up in the past where we've coached people who are in the mid 60s and we're kind of holding on to the mid 60 kilos and competing in weightlifting quite regularly and hit those kind of um, plateaus or hit those roadblocks in their training. And as Owen said, it was absolutely an anomaly that those athletes didn't do better when they gained some muscle. And even at 60 kilos, gaining three kilos, and it's not going to be a three kilos of pure muscle tissue, but gaining three kilos and slowly building up and doing a bit of an accumulation phase just makes such, it's, it's a life-changing difference in terms of their athletic life. Uh, just getting a bit bigger, getting a bit stronger, filling out a small bit more and uh, makes such a massive difference. Like weightlifting is a sport of lifting weights. And I know there's staying within a weight class and being competitive in a weight class. But at the end of the day, you want to be the biggest and strongest person possible to lift the most weight possible. And it's it it's at odds with other sports where being lighter is going to be beneficial um, or being more lean is going to be beneficial. Weightlifting isn't that sport. Powerlifting isn't that sport. Um, and we've seen, we, we've talked about this a number of times, we've seen a lot of athletes being held back by not just giving themselves the latitude to gain a few kilos, to go up a small but gain that strength they need to gain. Um, and then a host or a myriad of other issues go away, like that kind of in massive amount of doms after their heavy volume sessions or those niggly injuries that tend to pop up all the time or a uh, back that's constantly sore and every time they go through a training cycle, they'll get three months into a training block and their back will explode again. Those issues tend to be alleviated when we have a bit more muscle and a bit more mass to accept that that weight with. Niall Barrington says, hi lads, what weight class are you looking forward to for the World Cup in Thailand? Second question, at what point do you recommend people starting to use a belt for squatting, etc.? So my favorite classes are going to be any class where the Irish athletes are competing. I think there's two or three Irish lifters over there now. And to be honest, my uh, my nationalism comes out in me a small bit there. I love to see Irish athletes competing, not just in weightlifting, across all sports. It, it means a bit more to me when there's a green singlet on the stage. So they're the classes I'll, I'll really be tuning into. I know we've a lot of other stuff going on. There's big names and superstars. I'll be excited about those big names and superstars when I see them at the Olympic stage and it's the kind of ultimate. Um, weightlifting is always the 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 Olympic uh, sport for me. It's it's the one I'll, I'll... The performances at the Olympics mean the most. The Thailand thing for me, it's any competition where there's Irish athletes I'll be excited about. In regards to wearing a belt, so generally we recommend like after the first year you can start to wear a belt if you so wish unless there's something drastically wrong. The only time we think you shouldn't wear a belt is if it covers up pain. So if you go from squatting without, with pain without a belt on, and then you put on a belt, the pain is gone, then you need to probably address something, which does happen sometimes. But more often than not, once you're kind of beyond that first year of lifting, then you know, you're know you good to go using the belt, and you're probably fairly well adapted to whatever adaptions you're going to get without the belt there. And then you can periodically not use the belt as appropriate but if it's been more than a year of pretty serious strength training uh, you're good to to throw it on uh up next then we have mm -hmm. smith jitsu oh, yeah. and he says hey gents getting back to it after being sick for a couple of weeks 
probably a good squat progression to run prior to starting the RTA. So there's two things to this. The first thing is getting back from sickness. And it's it seems to have happened more in the last two years than it's ever happened, or we've definitely dealt with it more. And um, getting back after sickness actually isn't as simple a thing of alleviation of symptoms and feeling better again. And you can just kind of hop straight back into training. Definitely with the respir respiratory tract stuff, it takes a bit more. There's a bit more kind of cushioning needed around training. So my usual recommendation there is for two weeks, you're just going to go back in and do general training sessions in the gym. So doing some squatting on the first day with some pressing or pulling, then doing your kind of main pulling or RDLs or deadlifts on the second day, and just do two or three days a week, however much you usually do. Moderate weights, just stick to kind of two sessions and swap them in and out. Just get back to the point where you're lifting weights and you're feeling good after it without being on a, a kind of very regimented progression scale. Now, once you're back in and you've done the week or two of that kind of generalized training, a great way to get back into your RTA is you do a two-week on-ramp. So your two-week on-ramp will look like taking week one, taking those training sessions. First week, you're going to take off 15 or 20% off. So this is week one minus two, and it's three by 10 at, at say, 60% on week one. Then you're going to do three by 10 at 50% or at 45%. Do that. Do those two sessions. Then you do week one minus one. And it's going to be probably a seven and a half percent reduction on the load. And then your third week of proper training is going to be week one of the RTA. So it's a nice two week on ramp. Those sessions are going to feel super easy. Probably not going to have too much DOMS. You'll probably get them done very, very quickly. But that's the whole aim here is to not jump back on that cart before you can really hold on and go for it. Um, so that return to play or return to structured training is probably a three or four week uh, period rather than just kind of a one week on ramp into it. Leon says, going through the wave program, what does two plus two clean and jerk mean? It means two cleans and then two jerks. So just a clean and jerk double. Also, can I add in some bodybuilding work since I want to do a cut and retain muscle? Um, you can add in some, but don't go crazy with it. Also, bear in mind you know, that if you're cutting weight, and you're doing bodybuilding, and you're doing the weightlifting program, there's a lot of systemic fatigue on the system. So it's important to remember that it's going to probably negatively affect your strength training, your weightlifting. And don't forget as well that it can negatively affect your physique. So while you may lose fat, you may have a physique that is not as linear in regards to progression might be if you're uh, unidirectional with your fatigue. So if you fatigue from weightlifting, hypertrophy fatigue specifically, and then you have the fatigue of low calories, you are physique might be kind of watery, kind of mushy. It might be something that is not as ideal. So do bear in mind that your goals and your training need to be, you know, as direct or as smart as possible. So just bear that in mind if the outcomes are what you want. Unmec says, what would be a good idea to run, or would it be a good idea to run RTA plus Sika pull for a clean or snatch pull to bring my strength up for weightlifting? So in this case, RTA is great. Make sure you just take out all the other squats you have. Any front squats you have during the week, make sure they're done off your one rep max clean rather than your one rep max uh, front squat. Making sure, obviously, those numbers aren't the exact same, but in most cases, that will work quite well. So squatting twice a week and then front squatting probably once a week that will work well for all weightlifters. Now, in terms of the pull, the best results we see are people doing it with their clean deadlift. So rather than being a snatch deadlift or a snatch pull or even a clean pull, the best results we see are using that Sika pull program with their clean deadlift. The weights are high. You're still getting that neuromuscular uh, adaptation there. You're going to be developing a lot of back strength as well using the clean pull. So that would be my recommendation. Mm -hmm. Ozzy Ozk says how would you to return to training after an illness i finished week four day two or oh, the big heavy one uh, and got sick for nine days now i can't do the same weight for a double so this is very similar to what i was saying to smith jitsu there in terms of the rta and your time off we've recommendations so a rule of thumb we have here is you reverse the same amount of time you took off so in your case nine days ten days off you reverse two weeks in the program so you're just after finishing week four, going on to week five. So you'd be starting week three again on that program. If that illness, though, was particularly respiratory centered or if it was something that really hit your system quite hard, I'd go back and listen to what we said to Smith Jitsu. That would be my recommendation. And in your case, 
I just recommend starting back at week one of the RTA, uh, restarting it, building that momentum again over time. Cormac Ross says, hey lads, really like the recovery tips video. Uh, if I have to wait 90 minutes after training before I eat, would a post-workout car plus protein shake potentially increase recovery for the next training day? Yeah, so I'm probably looking at if you're waiting 90 minutes, and probably some intra-workout carbs, maybe some EAs or BCAs in there as well for the, uh, might as well show yeah. them in. Uh, but carbohydrates probably the main to be looking at there. 90 minutes. Um, definitely post workout shake or intra workout shake would be appropriate there. So maybe somewhere between 50 to 100 grams of carbs. I don't know how much you've available to you or what your diet is like or how much you're cutting or whatever, but definitely be kind of at least maybe 50 or intra workout or post workout and then having a bit more carbs before training as well. So if you have to wait a long time after, I'd probably preemptively load a lot of those pre workout carbs as well during your day i'd even take some away from breakfast and lunch if that's available to you or if that's something you can sustain but if you're waiting 90 minutes after there is a lot of benefit to that immediate training session and there does seem to be the preceding training session carbohydrates are quite interesting in the fact that uh, they're not necessarily hyper anabolic but they're very anti-catabolic if you look at there's interventionist studies done on 100 grams of carbs in the absence of protein and they maintain muscle mass very 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 well and it's specifically postulated that, that it might be from an anti-catabolic effect so i would be looking at definitely carbs before during and after that training especially if they've waited a bit longer ivan says hi lads if you've to design a program for ivan Durek uh to get him to a 300 kilo squat what would it look like assuming zero rest days of squat every day just the roti in there but you would just have the most kiss me ass days where it's like a barbell squat for a single and you'd go home if you had to stipulate yeah or sit in the bottom of a bodyweight squat for five minutes and do a mobility session yeah max offerman says probably gonna lose some body fat for the next two months i think the best training strategy for training best strategy for training is to go hard into hypertrophy but i don't think one of your programs corresponds to that advice so definitely off-season strength and hypertrophy program so we put everybody on if they come to us wanting a cut uh, it definitely works the best. Also, the intensity is quite high. You get a lot of extra work in. My added advice there is to add in some cardio work just for that increased caloric expenditure. Something like the rolling erg program or the running program is absolutely perfect. Wei Cheng says, hi, lads. Asha Kalua says, in programs, when Superman planks go from 20 seconds holds to 12 second holds, should I move my arms further away and it's becoming a horse? Yeah, move your arms further away, small but more of that kind of isometric hold, squeeze into it a small bit harder, aim to make the quality as best you could possibly make it. And um, the last thing I will say on that is when we have small step backs in intensity as you go through the course of a block, those step backs in intensity are there for a reason. So it might be that the intensity over the course of the week or the total volume you're doing that week is actually quite high and you need a step back or we need to pull back on those complexes or those uh, supersets. So don't immediately think that you have to make it as hard as every other week has been. If there's a step back, the step back is there for a reason. Step back. Bring Me My Fix says, started a weekly boxing class this year as a testament to the power of seeker training. When we do high intensity body weight squats in the warm up. I'm the only person gets going full depth and I'm 51 for fuck's sake. Okay. Yeah, that's great to hear. Yeah. Lewis probably said, hello guys, my hips rise all the time in the clean and the snatch. I clean on 50, but I literally can't feel them rising. My coach skews aren't seeming to help and it happens even at light weights. So if first place to start is obviously cueing something to address it. So if the cues aren't working, if you want to stop doing something, then you focus on stop doing it or start doing something else that will lead to a corresponding change and you stopping doing the thing you want to stop doing. So keep hammering cues. There's nothing outside of cueing, which is just another word for doing it different in weight of thing that would affect it. Even if it is a strength or mobility issue, you still have to cue it correctly in the lift. So the main focus here is you keep cueing or keep focusing on doing the thing you need to do. You might need to start changing the language around what you're doing. You might need to change your position. So Maybe your feet are too narrow, maybe your feet are too wide, maybe you're pushing your knees back much too early, maybe the barbell is too close to you, like any number of things causing a particular change here. You need to figure out, 
is there an extraneous cause that's not letting you change that? That's a, based on the technical stuff you're doing in positions that you could change immediately. And then you could start looking at it in regards to strength issues. Now, to be honest, usually with the hips rising too early, it's very rarely a strength issue because very often these have to be by nature are submaximal in terms of your squat and submaximal in terms of your deadlift. So you can keep your hips down. This is Lewis not to point fingers but this is a you problem that like you need to fix this in regards to the positions and very 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 important is that some cues might need to be focused on for six months or more it's a bit it's probably a product it's definitely a product not probably a product pro definitely a product of the again kind of commercialization of weightlifting coaching is that people view it as a product more than the art and science of coaching so let's say, Lewis, you were in a national training center somewhere and you still couldn't do this, you'd still be working on this for the next six months. And it wouldn't be a case of, okay, well, it would be some other case, you'd be looking at different things to address it, but ultimately you'd still be doing the same thing. And even if you get the same thing right the first time, that's no guarantee that you're still going to, you can just stop focusing on it. A lot of times you'll still have to keep focusing on it for the next six months or more, or you might have to keep focusing on it for the rest of your weightlifting career. So... The main thing here is still trying to fix the issue. There's no reason that it should be fixed quickly. You know, at a 150 kilo clean, you're pretty far along on in terms of weightlifting. So those issues are going to be a bit harder to clean, you know, to, to address. So it could be leg strength issue. Like if you're cleaning 150 and your best front squat's 160, even then you still have the strength to address it. So the next place you could probably go or possibly go if you wanted to is looking at maybe some pause cleans, some low hang cleans, see if it addresses the issue. But remember, when you're doing pause cleans or when you're doing low hang cleans or any of those things, they seem like they're making a change. They're not really making you stronger in that absolute strength sense when we are thinking about this. They are just reinforcing that pattern that you need to learn. So it's not that, okay, look, is that technically strength? Maybe because you're getting a better outcome in your lift. But in terms of like absolute strength values, that's not making you stronger per se in any specific joint angle because they're essentially the same things you're going through. It is to a certain extent, not to be crass, but by and large, they're just telling you to reinforce a certain position. So you could look at some variations like pause snatch cleans or pause snatches, low hang cleans or low hang snatches. And still though, you still comes back to you practicing the lifts correctly. So again, Lewis, this is on your internal dialogue and your ability to address your ability to do something like if you can clean 150 you have certainly enough proprioception awareness to fix this uh possibly it's just gotten to a stage where you've gotten so annoyed by it and caught up that it's very hard to clean but hey no pun intended clean up but still still lewis it's still on you to fix this with your sequential thoughts when you're cleaning and snatching yeah, it's funny. We we do a lot of like coach education seminars and upskilling seminars with coaches in different gyms. And we spend probably 40 minutes of a lecture just going over queuing and that kind of system of queuing. And that 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 repeated sequential work with verbal cue initially, which is probably the point where you're at, and a verbal cue of keep your hips down doesn't work. Then we usually go to verbal and visual, or we change what the verbal is. And then we go after the visual cue and something doesn't work, we go to a kinesthetic cue. So as Gurf is saying, you have all the skills there to do it. You don't need to change anything necessarily. You might just need to change how you think about it, or maybe you need to do it with 60 kilos and feel what it's like at 60 kilos. Then audit that feeling in your head. Maybe you need to sit down and write it out after each training session. This is what 60 kilos feels like. This is what I feel. Where's the weight on my feet? What do I feel in my quads? What do I feel in my shoulders and back? And then you creep up and you say, okay, I don't feel that. I don't feel it. I just feel there's no weight in my feet or the weights towards my heels or whatever as my hips shoot up and then kind of audit those systems. Okay. Do we... Yeah. Um, I saw someone say, oh, I did a PB yesterday, 220 high bar on the RTA 2.0. That's nice. great. Folks. Thank, thanks for many. No, thanks for my training technique, but really transformed over the last 18 months. That's fantastic to hear. Okay. Thanks for all your questions, guys. Really appreciate them. We'll see you next week for another live stream. And thanks for all your questions. And best of luck with your training this weekend.